Alright, so let's start off with the basic. Victoria 2 economy is quite simple at its core. The entire money supply is limited at all time, and there are only two ways to acquire new wealth in the world. The first one is very straightforward. You mine precious metal, and they convert directly to gold. So any provinces that has precious metal will generate wealth that is new every single day. The second way that is available to generate wealth is through specific events. So sometimes some countries will receive events and one of the option of these events will be able to generate a lump sum of money that will be new money added to the game. But outside of these two events, there's no way to generate new wealth. Any taxation, tariff, sales of goods, purchase of goods is made with existing money in the world and the money is dispersed all over. It can be in the, the banks of countries and can be in a private investor that are not represented but can hold actual money in the game. It is also in the pockets of your population so each different class will have a set amount and that set amount in the population chart is divided equally across every single one of the population of that specific class. And my idea to make Victoria 2 run as a fiat economy rather than one that is backed by the precious metal is to remove the first way to inject new money in the game, making effectively the gold to cash rate setting in the defined file of the game become zero. Doing so will cause every single province that generates gold become effectively useless because their generation will be at zero. And this is the entire idea of the video. So I want to see what happens when you severely limit the amount of new wealth that can be introduced into Victoria's 2 economy and you force every nation, every population, every factories, everything to be competing for the same fixed amount while everything else in the world keeps increasing. I want to see at the end if effectively the price of goods will skyrocket or if the price of goods will fall down flat on their face. So the only real way is after changing the variable, I decided to let the game plays itself without interfering in any way, shape or form for the entire period of 100 years. The simplest way to actually do that is to pick a country like AT and run the command debug assert which removes all pop-up in the game and you can also run the command debug FOW to remove the fog of war. Of course knowing me very well you know I forgot to input both of these commands so hmm, that's a problem like another you know. The first order of the day will be to take a look at the different countries. For example, here the United Kingdom has 20 grand in the bank at the start of the game, so we'll see how that changes early on. They also have a pretty solid industry. Now, if we take a look at France, we can see they have less than 2 grand in the bank, which hmm, looks like a bad start, and the industrialization is very poor, to say at least. After looking at these two main principal countries, we'll just go back to AT, and let time fly. After a few minutes, it will be possible to notice that the price of the goods are going up rapidly at the start of the game, but they quickly come to a sort of stalemate where they reside at the same price level for a, a longer period than expected. Now the reason is that when I was making the actual recording, really the only setting I've changed was to modify the value of gold to cash rate from 0.5 gold per unit produce of precious metal to 0 gold per unit of precious metal produced. And the consequence is that it limits severely the amount of money, but the impact is minimal at the start because the production of precious metal is very small early on. And the reason for the price of the good to stagnate at the same amount for such a long period is actually pretty simple. There are art coded value limits for items in Victoria 2, which as I mentioned, I wasn't aware early on, so I did not make any modification to that. So every good eventually reached the ceiling price for its value as long as the demand was present and keep increasing. 
So the price did not skyrocket as high as I expect them to be. And the reason really is just that I did not figure it out in time that I had to remove the ceiling price for these goods. But we will now proceed on our first tour. Uh, after two years of game time, let's take a look at every country. For United Kingdom, on January 1st, 1838, there's still around 25k of money in the bank account, which is very similar to what they started with. The production chart shows pretty average normal stuff for the UK. And if we look at the factories, we can see that they do expand and create new factories, which means they're injecting the money they have into making sure that the economy rolls smoothly. Now let's take a quick look at France and we can see that the coffer of the country did enlarge a lot from the 102k to now almost 17k in stock and we can see that the fiscal policies are pretty sustainable for the moment and taxation is maxed out according to the policies of the liberal party if we take a look at the factories we can see there's a little bit of money invested in it but it is quite limited and not comparable to the uk so so early on but that is absolutely normal for a game so so up until now judging by the two leading country uh Removing the value of precious metal doesn't seem to have any negative impact on their economy yet. So let's take a look at the third country, Russia. And we can see that they're completely broke at the moment with absolutely no money in the bank. And they're taking loans from different private investors and banks of other countries. And they're losing a lot of cash throughout the day. But they still have a better industrialization score than France does. So there's always that going for them. All right, so let's go back into the time machine called IT and let the role time forward a couple more years to see what's going on with the world. In the meantime, I have a quick time lapse of the world market economy. And again, I still wasn't aware at that moment there was cap to the value price of every commodity. So th there's nothing impressive going on to be seen here. So it is now 1841, five years after the start of the game. And if we take a look at the United Kingdom, they are definitely expanding steadily and having more and more money invested in their country. It doesn't still seem like changing the value of precious metal has any impact on them. I also took a quick look at the population and I've been able to see that the population were able to save a little bit of money and really the only explanation I have for that is due to the uh, price ceiling that is uh, on every commodity. They don't have to expand every single cent they have to acquire the life goods they need since they're part of the world most powerful country. They have priority access to every single resource in that sphere. Now looking at still second country France, we can see that they do have some money in the bank and score has been increasing steadily but I'll bait a little bit slowly, I'll give you that for sure, and the population seems to have absolutely no saving. So I believe that we may start seeing some impact of the modification we have done. Limiting the access of the money will definitely probably have more impact on lower ranking countries. Now if we take a look at Russia, we are able to see that they're now not broke anymore, they do have some money. And it's mostly coming from taxation and they still have important amount of loans outstanding right now. So I'm not sure if that will have an impact on the country as such, but I'm fairly certain that Russia is playing fairly normal until now. All right, now it will be time to take a look at the United States of America, the fifth country in the world. And we can see they have a substantial amount of money saved in the bank. And they have a pretty nice industrialization going on. And now we go back to the time machine called IT to go around and uh, roll a little bit more time. Once again, I made the mistake of uh, deciding to take a watch over the market prices without realizing that there was a cap on a maximum value. Actually, I, I'd be interested to know if uh, you'd rather see me retried this experiment but remove the cap in the the ceiling and the the floor of the merchandise price 
you see what really happens when you have a limited amount of money and unlimited prices on good. You'll probably be able to see uh, munitions skyrocketing to incredible prices during wars and uh, order goods like dyes going very high and convoys and machine parts going to excessive prices when the demand is very high, especially at the start of the game. Alright, we are now 1815, so effectively 14 years into the game, and we can see the chart looks fairly normal, albeit maybe every little country seems a little bit weaker than I would expect around that time. But at the same time, since I have no direct input into the game, uh, I think that it it is not a very surprising outcome to take a look at what was going on. I also do a slight overview over the map. It seems like everything has been stable. It doesn't appear like there has been any real war or any conquest of any country going on. So now let's go into the United Kingdom. And we can see they have amassed an incredible amount of money at 1.78 million pounds in their bank account. It seems like they're doing very, very well when it comes to having no new generated wealth outside of random events. Uh, their industrialization is skyrocketing, they're building and expanding factories everywhere. It seems like uh, it, it, it's rolling like a normal UK. Now if we take a look at the France, they were able to amass even more money at two million pounds and uh, their, their factories have a better fairing at this moment with much more factories being built and new factories employing more people. So there also seems to be uphill when it comes to their industrial and economical aspect of the game. And now let's take a good look at the friend, the Russian Empire, and we can see that they're still broke. And they're very expansionist right now with uh, wars going on in Central Asia against Koken and Kiev, I think, from these flags. I don't remember. Ah, uh, yes, exactly. The planned route for Russian imperialism, playing chess and stuff in uh, Central Asia. Everything seems to be uh, slightly better, except they're still broke. And they have almost no factories going on, so... I don't know, seems like a standard Russian game until now, still. You know, if we take a look at the Americans, uh, they're broke now, completely broke, but they don't have any loans, so they're able to manage their no money status, and they have managed to overcome the Russian on the latter, becoming the fourth country in the world after UK, France, and Germany. So they do have a pretty solid ground to stand on right now. And uh, seems like, again, changing the economy to go to fiat doesn't seem to have a, an impact that is quite massive on these leading countries, at least until now, for the 14 first years in the game. And I've also decided to give a quick visit to our friends Spain, who are completely broke, have no industry, and seems like they will go downhill very quickly. They're not building any factories. They barely have any factories. They, it seems like a pretty, pretty bad situation to be in Spain right now. Uh, yeah, that, that it's a bit too close to home right now, isn't it? And now I'll do something I've never done. Uh, it's 1851 and I'm going through the the journals, the newspaper that, uh, you know, the, the pop-up nobody ever look at. And it just shows that, uh, yeah, it's not very, very, very interesting to go through these. Uh, it seems like copy-pasting stuff over all the time and uh, random stories and put into the newspaper. I still don't understand what was the reason behind actually creating the newspaper stuff in the game. It's just it's just weird, you know. And now it's 1854 and I did uh, cut off the uh, monitoring the market stuff for now because, yeah, the price don't really move. But let's take a look at Mexico because they're fighting against the United States and looking from the map from far away, it seems like they are winning but they're most likely not because they have very poor military score. They have almost no armies 
uh, their allies are all over the place. I, I'm not sure what the U.S. did prior, uh, but it seems like Mexico has the upper end until now. So let's take a quick look at the USA to... Okay, yeah, definitely Mexico's going to lose this war because uh, the United States just formed their own first army. It's pretty surprising huh? when you, you bully the U.S. They, they just... Thousands of soldiers out of nowhere just come and try and conquer your stuff and everything, you know? And also, surprisingly enough, the United States was able to colonize uh, right dab in the middle of British Columbia, cutting Alberta and British Columbia from the UK. And now comes the sad part of this video. So my plan at that point was to just zoom out and do a standard timeline, fly, timesheet, time lapse. I don't know how you call it anymore. It's, it's getting late now. Uh, of the world to especially Europe to see what was going on with all the wars until 1835 but for some reason the recording didn't work so we're stuck with the indie screen and we can see that Germany UK USA Japan Italy France the Chinese Empire and Australia are all great power and that's quite surprising honestly so let's go and take a closer look to 1935 all right, so let's start with a quick overview of the world. So the United States did very, very solid here. They took over most of Northwestern America. They took over a little bit of Mexico. And uh, if we go down south, there's a little bit of difference from usual in South America. For example, Venezuela did form Grand Colombia, which is great. Moving to Africa, we don't have anything very surprising. Uh, Spain, France, UK. Ottoman split apart uh, the entirety of Africa, so everything looks like it is in order. Ethiopia and Egypt seem to be fully constituted, uh, Tunisia and Algeria still standing ground. But if we go into Europe, it, it, <laughs> it's very different. So we can see that uh, France is being completely overrun by Belgium and Portugal, which is <laughs> very, very weird. If we move east, we can see that Germany formed and it has a pretty substantial uh, part of the land. Uh, Poland is also present, very surprising also, probably a result of a crisis. Austria-Hungary, uh, Italy and the rest of the Balkans look normal. So let's go on to the far east and we can see that the Chinese Empire, Korea, Japan, Manchuria, everything is in order and up north we had a pretty weak Soviet Union. As for India, everything is in norms and Persia is still present the map. So let's go and deep dive into the United Kingdom and we can see they have an incredible amount of money they're currently at war against Italy, Brazil and Switzerland and they're number two in the world so they definitely lost a little bit of power here but they still have very strong industry and sustainable economy and uh, looks like everything has been pretty fine for them there has been no major revolution uh, I, it, it just looks like a normal game up to now and now taking a look at the USA uh, as I mentioned earlier they have acquired a lot of territory they're probably the country that fared the best and surprisingly enough they're actually lead by the socialist party which is strange to say the least that a um, a democracy elect socialist I, I rarely see that so i think this may definitely be an effect on the modification we did to the gold to cash rate and taking a look uh, or the rest of the world we can see they have very little friends uh, a lot of people seem to be despising the united states of america in this playthrough so now let's go and take a look at the uh, world's strongest country, Germany. And we can see they have researched everything. They have a lot of money. They're actually pretty lax on taxation here. And they have very strong industrial power. It seems like every single state has everything upgraded and built uh, as much as possible, which is pretty impressive for a liberal party at the power. But uh, otherwise, it... it they're, they are definitely a strong nation in the game at the moment with their high prestige, high industrialization, and pretty substantial 
military power. And now we take a look at the fifth country, Italy, who also is in a pretty solid condition. They do, after all, have the strongest army, probably thanks to their navy more than anything else. They have a pretty good amount of cash in stock, and uh, it seems like uh, industrialization is going very well for them too, with a lot of expanded factories and a lot of built factories. But they're still at war with the United Kingdom, Austria-Hungary, Spain, and I believe Egypt. So they're in a precarious condition to say the least so now let's go and take a look at china mm. china is the eighth power in the world so the last great power and this is pretty surprising because usually when china goes ahead and become westernized they become the single strongest country but here it seems like they had some sort of issue at some point because they have a, a massive loan taken and they, they could repay it but they didn't do it and uh, if we look at industrialization it's pretty low they have almost no prestige and they do have some sphere country who seem to have broken loose out of their influence and are completely independent at this point which is uh, pretty surprising to see so definitely changing the gold rate has a massive impact onto uh, China so now let's take a look at the Netherlands because they're the one that acquired Johor, who is the, uh, the the largest production of precious metal in the game, and they fare pretty badly, being a secondary power at the 11th position. But at least uh, they have pretty nice, reasonable prestige, and that's pretty much it. So they're not too far off being a great power, but they're not quite there yet. And to finish off this video, I decided to uh, boot up the Victoria 2 economical save analyze tool and just take a look at the uh, population, GDP of every country, uh, the amount of RGO and factories employment, unemployment, sorry. And uh, to be honest, I very rarely load saves into this, so I have no idea if it is good or bad, but I can definitely show you another saved game that is completed with uh, everything vanilla so you can have a quick idea of the comparison between both of them and this is pretty much it for victoria 2 fiat economy i understand it's not the the best interpretation of fiat monetary system that exists but uh, it's a uh, it's a good title for the video so hopefully you've enjoyed this quick video if you have some suggestion to make it better uh, make sure to drop them in the comment section Thank you for watching and see you next time.